Good day, grade 12s. I hope you've had a good day and you are ready to get stuck in and do some more revision on paper one. Um, like I said, we're working through some old exam papers. We've done paper one, we've done another paper two, and now we're working on paper one again. And basically, I'm just going to keep doing this until we have made sure to revised all the sections um, and made sure you've seen a whole bunch of exam papers to that you can um, make sure that you are ready for these finals or the prelims and then the finals. Okay, so it says solve for x. We got as far as this yesterday. Okay, so we're moving on with question, I don't know what the question is, question two. It says solve for x corrected two decimal places. So the minute you see corrected two decimal places, what are we going to use? We're obviously going to use the formula. So if we're using the formula, you need to go and find it on the formula sheet if you don't know it. The formula is equal to x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay, x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay, now, what do we need to do? The first thing we need to do after realizing what the formula is, is we need to get this into the format that we can substitute into this. So we need to multiply this out and get it into proper format. So let's do that. We've got 2 x plus 1 squared is equal to 9. So we've got 2 x squared plus 2 x plus 1 is equal to 9. Now we need to multiply this out. So it becomes 2x squared plus 4x plus 2 is equal to 9. Right, so now what we need to do is break the 9 across. So we've got 2x squared plus 4x plus 2 minus 9 equals 0. So if we got 2x squared plus 4x minus 7 equals 0. Okay, so now the whole point about this is that we want to substitute into this. So I just want to show you which ones are A, B's and C's. This is the whole of this is A, the whole of that is B, and obviously the whole of this, including the minus, is a C. So now what we're going to do is substitute into this formula. So we're going to go minus 4 plus minus the square root of b is 4 squared minus 4 times by a, which is 2, times by c, which is minus 7, all over 2 times by a, which is 2. So we've got minus 4 plus or minus the square root of 4 squared is 16, minus times minus is a plus, 4 times 2 is 8, and 8 times 7 is 56, all over 4. And now because they're saying correct to two decimal places, I'm thinking I'm going to need my calculator, so let's get it out and switch it on. So we're going to go minus 4, and let's do the plus first. So we're going to go plus the square root of 16 plus 56. Um, equals and then divided by 4 equals and that doesn't help at all so it's good it's 1.12132034 okay so what do they obviously want us to do they obviously want us to round off to two decimal places so we have to look at the third place and the third place is a one so what do we do we're going to look if the third one's a one it's less than five which means we round this down so it stays a two so one of the answers the first option is 1.12 so therefore this answer is going to be equals one comma one two or there's a second option so now we're going to have to use the minus so let's go and do that as well so let's clear this and this time i'm going to use the fraction buttons just so that you guys get used to seeing it so we've got minus four minus the square root of that's not the square root of the square root of 16 plus 56 all over 4, and I get bet you it's going to give me, yep. <laughs> so then we go there, and again, we need to round off to two decimal places. So we look at the third one, and it's a 1, so we can ignore it in a way. We just don't have to worry about rounding up. We can round down. So it becomes minus 3.12, so it's 
minus 3 comma 1 2 and then you always just check it said solve for x squared to two decimal places done done awesome sorted okay not too bad eh right now let's move on to this question it says solve for x and y simultaneously okay so we've got y is equal to minus 2x plus 7 and then we've got y plus 5 divided by x minus 1 equals a half okay so that looks a little bit scary do you agree because there's this fraction here but it isn't actually as scary as you'd think okay let's just think about this this is y is equal to 2x minus 7 so this is obviously got y as a subject to the formula is let's see if there's any way we could maybe get this to be the subject of the formula y to be the subject of the formula over here okay so we've got y plus 5 of x minus 1 is equal to a half so do you agree I could take this x minus 1 to the other side? I can multiply both sides by x minus 1. Okay, do you agree? So this cancels with this, and then we've got y plus 5 is equal to a half x minus a half. I'm just multiplying that out that bracket. Okay, and then do you see that we can now just take this 5 across the other side. We basically subtract in 5 from both sides. We take the y and becomes a half x minus a half minus 5, which becomes a half x minus 5 and a half. Awesome. So now we've got two equations with y as a subject of the formula. We've got y is equal to minus 2x plus 7 and y is equal to half x minus 5 and a half. So now, do you agree? I can just let these two equations equal each other. This one equals y. y is equal to minus 2x plus 7. And this one equals y. y is equal to half x minus 5 and a half. So I can say, therefore, we can say minus 2x plus 7 is equal to a half x minus five and a half okay we're going to worry about the halves in a minute let's take all the x's to one side and all the numbers to the other side and then see what we can do so we've got a minus 2x minus a half x is equal to minus five and a half minus seven now grade 12s it really doesn't matter if i took it the other way around obviously obviously then i'd have pluses everywhere which would be lovely but it really doesn't matter so this becomes minus two and a half x minus five minus seven is minus 12 so this becomes minus 12 and a half so obviously i'm going to divide both sides by minus to get rid of the minus now i really am irritated by those fractions but i don't have to worry too much because i'm almost finished all i'm going to do is divide both sides by two and a half okay this cancels with this you've got x and now we can just get out our calculators and we can say 12.5 divided by 2.5 equals 5. Yay, so x equals 5. Right, so if we've got that x equals 5, we now need to find y. Okay, so we can substitute either into the y is equal to minus 2x plus 7, or you can substitute into this original one on this side, or we can substitute into this equation here, which I'm going to call equation 3. Okay, it doesn't matter where you substitute it, as lot because it's all the same thing. It's all going to give you the same value of y. So let's substitute into this first equation. So you're going to y is equal to minus 2 times by 5 plus 7. And the reason I'm choosing that one is because it just seems the easiest one for me. Okay. So it becomes minus 10 plus 7, which is minus 3. Now grade 12, last thing. You can't just write x equals 5 and y equals minus 3. They really want you to put it in as a coordinate. Okay. So therefore, your final answer, you need to write... 5 minus 3 is your answer. Okay, you need to show that, admittedly, this one is really easy in the sense that there's only one x value and therefore one only one y value. But if they were mean, okay, they could have actually had it so that there was, well, not mean, but if it's a normal one, in a more normal one, they would actually have had probably a quadratic and a linear equation, in which case there'll be two x's and two y's, and then you have to show which x belongs to which y and vice versa. 
Okay, let's look at this last question on the page. It looks actually looks very interesting. It says determine the values of p for which the equation 3x equals 1 minus p will have real solutions. Okay, they've got 3 to the x equals 1 minus p. And it says determine the value of p for which the equation will have real solutions. Okay, so what it's saying is that it cannot. Okay, so what we could do is we could log both sides. Let's log both sides. So we're going to say that this is log. Is that going to help? Yes, it is. Log 3 to the power of x is equal to log of the whole of 1 minus p, right? Then you can, using the log rules, take the x to the front. So you get x is going to be log of 1 minus p over log of 3. Okay, so now you cannot get a negative log and you cannot get um, Oh, uh, you know what? There was a much easier way of doing this. Sorry, I just realized. Sorry. Yep. Okay. 3 to the x is equal to 1 minus p. This is an exponential graph. An exponential graph, positive exponential graph, is going to do something like this. Whee! So for this to be true, this whole thing has to be greater than 0. Okay? This whole thing is greater than 0. Never touches the 0. Therefore, 1 minus p must also be greater than 0. Okay, do you agree? Um, therefore, we can say that minus p must be greater than minus 1, just taken across. Therefore, p must be smaller than 1. And that's your answer. That's how easy that is. So the value of p is that p must be smaller than 1 for this equation to have real solutions. That's how easy it was. You just had to think out of the box a bit. Right, let's talk about arithmetic sequences and geometric sequences and see what we can do. It says a is equal to minus 2 plus x plus dot 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 and b is equal to minus 2 plus x plus dot 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 are given. Okay, the first two terms of the arithmetic series, this is an arithmetic series and the geometric series b, this is a geometric series, are the same. Okay, minus 2 plus x, minus 2 plus x. Okay, this so is write down in terms of x, the third term of the geometric series, b. Okay, so do you agree that for a geometric series, you've got t3 divided by t2 has to equal t2 divided by t1. Okay, that's the way it works. In other words, if we want to find the ratio, we have to work them out, okay? So to get the common ratio, we have to go T2 divided by T1. So the common ratio here is going to be X divided by negative 2, right? So X divided by negative 2 is R, okay? Now we need to find the next term. So we need to take X and multiply it by X over negative 2, so we end up with negative x squared over 2. That is what's going to be the next term, minus x squared over 2. Right, the third term of the arithmetic series is very easy because the common difference is going to be x minus minus 2, which becomes x plus 2. So then when we add that to the second term, we end up with 2x plus 2. We add x plus x plus 2 becomes 2x plus 2. Right, now it says if the sum of the first three terms, okay, the sum of the first three terms of the arithmetic series is equal to just the third term, the third term of the geometric series, term 3 of b, okay, calculate the value of x. So what are they saying? Normally I'd work out the sum equation, but we don't have to. It's going to be minus 2 plus x plus 2x plus 2, okay, is equal to minus x squared over 2. That's what they're saying, 
okay? And they say, calculate the value of x. Okay, so first of all, minus two cancels with two. This is awesome. X plus two x is three x. So three x is equal to minus x squared over two. I can multiply both of these by two. So we end up with six x is equal to negative x squared. Okay, so if I take this across this side, I get, I'm just gonna write it again, zero is equal to minus x squared minus six x. Do you agree? Then I can take out a minus and I get an, an x. So I take out a minus x and do you get um, x plus six is equal to zero. So x is gonna equal naught or x is gonna equal to minus six. Okay, so if x equals to naught, then we end up with minus two, naught, two. Okay, that works. If it is naught here, we get minus two, naught, naught. Hmm, not so much. Let's try if it was minus six, then it would be minus two, minus six, Two times minus six is minus 12 plus two is going to be minus 10. That works for that one. If it's minus six here, it would be minus two, minus six, minus six squared is 36 divided by two is 18. Um, 18, so it becomes minus 18. 18 divided by six is three and six divided by three is two. Beautiful. So the value of x is minus six. Yay. Here we go. If x is minus six, whoop, whoop, we know we got it right. <laughs> it says, does the geometric series B converge? Show the calculations to support to answer. Okay. Right. In order for a geometric series to converge, your R, your ratio, has to be between one and minus one. Okay. Um, so we've worked out what the R is already. We worked it out to be, what did we work it out to be there? X divided by minus two. Okay. So we worked it out to be X divided by minus two, which is going to be minus six divided by minus two, which is minus three, which definitely does not fall between one and minus one. So I can say, no, it does not converge does not converge and the reason I can say is that R is not between 1 and negative 1. Okay, but they said they want to show calculations to support your answer. So what you could do is you could try and show how the sum is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but basically what you could do is say, okay, we want to go to the sum to infinity. Basically what would happen is if it does converge, then the sum to infinity will become a specific number. But if you had a sum of a specific number of terms, okay? So for example, it's very easy. We say the sum of the first term is just minus two. The sum of the second term is going to be minus two minus six, which is minus eight. The sum of the third term is going to be minus eight minus 18, which is minus 26. So do you see that the number is getting bigger and bigger and bigger? It is not getting eight and eight to six. Yeah, it's not getting closer and closer to a specific number. So therefore we can say, no, it definitely does not converge. Okay, now it says the sum from k equals 1 to n, tk is equal to n squared plus 4n, where tk is a general term of a series, okay? So this is the general term of a series, and the sum of that series is equal to n squared plus 4n. Then it says calculate k equals 1 to 250 tk, um, from k is, okay, so what you have to do is the very first thing you have to do, okay, is work out the first three terms of the series, okay? So the first thing we do is find the first, the three terms. So term one is going to be one squared plus four times one, which is going to be five. Term two, is going to be 2 squared plus 4 times 2. 2 squared is 4 plus 8 is 12. 
term three is three squared plus four times three. Three squared is nine plus 12 is going to be 21, am I right? One squared is one plus four is five. Two squared is four. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of a Okay, right. Two squared is four, plus four times two is eight, so that's 12. Three squared is nine, plus four times three is 12, so now, okay, so we've got five, 12, 21. So the difference between five and 12 is definitely seven, and the difference between 12 and 21 is nine. Okay. Um, yeah. So they want us to work out the sum of 250 terms, but this is just to, to okay. I think this is a typo because I'll tell you why. Because of the fact that you guys have only done the term Tn is equal to a n squared plus b n plus c for geometric. This is a this this is a quadratic series, and you guys haven't done the sum for a geometric series, and this is what they're asking you to do. They're asking you to find out the sum for this geometric series. Um, and tk is equal to n squared plus 4n is the term. So in this case, it happens to be n squared plus 4n. And you guys haven't worked out that is a mistake. However, you can work out the hundredth term by just substituting that in. So you could work out t100, which is going to be 100 squared plus 4 times 100. Okay, which is going to be 100,000, or actually no, 10,000 plus 400, which equals 10,400. Um, yeah, and we're going to leave that as well. Okay, moving on. A pattern of triangles is formed by increasing the base of the triangle by two centimeters and the perpendicular height by one centimeter in each successive triangle. Okay, the first triangle is a base of 2 and a height of 2, next one 4 and 3, next one 6 and 4. So let's calculate the areas of the first four triangles. Okay, remember that area is a half times base times height. Okay, so this is going to be a half times 2 times 2, which is going to be 2 times 2 is 4 times a half is 2. Then this is a half times 4 times 3. So that's going to be 4 times 3 is 12, divided by 2 is 6. This is going to be a half times 6 times 4. 6 falls to 24, this is 12, okay? The next one is going to be 8 by 5. That's a half by 8 by 5. 5 eighths of 40. Halving it is going to give me 20. So do you agree that areas of the first ones are 2, 6, 12, and 20? So there's definitely not a common difference here because this goes up by 4, this goes up by 6, and this goes up by 8. Okay, so this is definitely a quadratic sequence. So what we need to do is find more space. So <laughs> what we're going to do is write over here on the right hand side. So we've got 2, 6, 12, 20. Remember that this number is going to be A plus B plus C. This here is 4. That is 6. And that is 8. And that number there is going to be 3A plus B. And then this is going to be 2, and that equals 2a. So therefore, a is equal to 1. Okay, we're going to substitute that in there. So we've got 3 times 1 plus b equals 4. Therefore, b is equal to 1. 
And now if we substitute into this, we've got A plus B plus C is going to equal 2. There was C equals 0 because A equals 1. B equals 1. That's already 2. So C has to equal 0. Therefore, my formula is Tn is equal to a n squared, which is 1 n squared, plus b n, which is 1 n plus c, which is 0. But obviously, I don't write the ones and the zeros. So it becomes n squared plus n. T n is n squared plus n. Okay, so if that's the case, we now want to work out the area of the hundredth tri uh, triangle. So we go T 100 is equal to 100 squared plus 100, which is going to be 10,000 plus 100, which is 10,000, oh, sorry, 100. There you go. Easy peasy. Okay, the trick here was to work out the area of the first four triangles and realize that what they're trying to tell you is that this is a quadratic sequence. Right, now it says in your answer book, well obviously we're not going to do it in the answer book because we don't have one, it's on the screen. It says draw a clear sketch of graph, okay, draw a clear sketch graph of function h as defined by h of x equal to a, b of x plus q, okay, where a is smaller than zero, b is greater than one, and q is smaller than zero. a, b, and q are real numbers. Indicate all intercepts with axes and asymptotes. Okay, fine. So let's just breathe for a minute and let's think about this. First of all, what type of this? This is obviously an exponential graph. So exponential graphs normally do this. If they're positive, if they're positive, they normally do this and go through one. If they're negative, then they normally do that and go through one. Okay, so let's have a look at it. They told us that a is smaller than zero, so this is going to look like that. That's the first part. This is if we don't have anything to do with anything else, okay? But now we've shifted it. <clears throat> we've shifted it so that q is smaller than zero. So we've shifted it down below the x-axis, so therefore my new graph and the graph that I would probably draw, well, would draw, oh, I hate it when it does that, is going to be like this. Um, instead of it being up one, it's going to be, I'll have a new asymptote down here somewhere, and it's going to cut like this and like that. Okay, where this value here would be negative q, okay, whatever that value is. Um, and then you'd obviously have an X and a Y cut. Okay, and there you go. That's all you can actually say at the moment about this graph. It's a negative exponential and it has been shifted down. Okay, nice question. Now it says the figure below represents the sketch graphs of f and g, where f is obviously the parabola and g is a straight line. Now let's just look at what it tells us. It says f of x is minus 2x squared minus 4x plus 30, which means we immediately know that that is 30. It also tells us that gx is 2x plus 10, so I immediately know that that is a 10. That's always nice. And we can see that the crossover there at a. A and B are the x-intercepts of curve F. The graph G passes through point H as well. C is a point of the intersection of F and G. And the graph of G intersects the y-axis at D. Okay, nothing we couldn't have worked out already. Next thing it says, determine the coordinates of A and B. In other words, they want to find it. Where does this thing cut the x-axis? In other words, what do we need to do? We need to factorize, okay? So we've got F of x is equal to minus 2x squared minus 4x plus 30. Okay, so if that's the case, we're going to factorize it. We're going to take it and let it equal 0, but we're going to divide everything by minus 2. So you end up with x squared plus 2x minus 15 equals 0. So now we need to factorize this, so we're going to go equals 0. So the factors of x are x and x. 
the factors are 15 are 5 and 3. We want a positive, so it has to be plus 5 and minus 3. Therefore, we can say that x is equal to minus 5 or x is equal to positive 3. So a is going to be, and listen, it says a coordinates of a. So you can't just go a is minus 5. You need to say that a is minus 5, 0, and that b is 3, 0. It didn't ask you for the x values of a and b. It asked for the coordinates, which means you have to give both x and y values even if, even if you um, know that they're just on the x-axis. Okay, now it says write the function of f in the form a x minus p squared plus q. Okay, so what are they asking us to do? They're actually asking us to complete the square. That's what they're asking us to do. That the format is actually the turning point formula. But what they're really asking us to do is to complete the square. So we have got f of x is equal to minus 2x squared minus 4x plus 30. So the first thing I'm going to do is divide everything by minus 2. You know, so I'm going to take out that a. So I'm going to go minus 2 and I'm left with x squared. Then I've got, um, I'm getting there, minus, um, I'm actually only going to take out the minus 2 from the side. So it becomes plus 2x, and then I'm going to go plus the t over here. Okay, but now we have to get it into that form. So what you need to do is to complete the square. So we're going to go equals minus 2 x squared plus 2x and then what do we do we halve this and square it so 2 divided by 2 is 1 we square it it's 1 okay plus the t and then what you have to do is you have to <clears throat> if you because we've added 1 here but it's multiplied by minus 2 we have to add 2 here as well Okay, do you see what I'm saying? Because minus 2 times plus 1 is actually minus 2. But I can't just add minus 2 to this equation. I have to get rid of it somewhere, so I have to add it there. Okay? So this becomes minus 2. You bring down the first one. You bring down the sign. You bring this last one down. You square it plus 32. So what is this really telling me? It's telling me the turning point is at minus 132. There you go. Okay, now it says determine whether 1 and 12 are the coordinates of C. Show all the calculations. Okay, so do you see that C is where these two graphs cut, right? It's where these two graphs cut with the parabola and the straight line cut. Now there are two ways that we can do this question. The one way that we could do it is we could substitute the value x equals 1 into both the straight line and into the parabola. And if the answers are both 12, then obviously this is c, is 12. The other way we can do it is we can simultaneously equate these equations and find the x values that they will cross at. And the one's going to be minus 5, obviously. And then the other one will be at C, which hopefully would be 1. And then you substitute in and get 12. So I think the shorter way would actually be just to substitute x equals 1 into both of these and see if you get out of 12. So let's do that. I'm going to go f of 1 is minus 2 times by 1 squared minus 4 times by 1 plus 30, which becomes minus 2 minus 4 plus 30 which is not 12, am I right? Minus two times by one squared, minus four times by one plus 30, um, which is minus two minus four, yep, does not equal 12. Therefore, that is not a coordinate of C. Okay, right, moving on. Now it says a straight line with the equation y is equal to mx plus 32, the Tangent to the graph of f. Calculate the possible values of f of m. Okay. 
Okay, do you agree that 32 at y equals 32? Okay, this graph cuts at 32. So it cuts at 32. If the straight line cuts at 32, the only way that this can be a tangent is if it's going straight across. Okay, because this turning point is at 32. So the only way that this graph can be a tangent is if it is parallel to the x-axis. Okay, and if it's parallel to the x-axis, what is its gradient? Its gradient is zero. Okay, now it says determine the values of x for which f of x multiplied, that was a nice question, I like that one. Determine the values of x for which f of x multiplied by dx is greater than zero. Okay, let's think about this. They want the values for which f of x multiplied by g of x is greater than zero. In other words, they want the y value of f of x has to be greater than zero and the y value of g of x of g of x has to be greater than zero or they both have to be negative, smaller than zero. Okay. So let's have a look at it and let's write read. Okay, so do you agree over here they are both negative, right? Do you agree over here they are both positive and they're still positive, both positive all the way from there. From there onwards, this is negative and this is positive. Okay, so it says determine the values of x. So it's going to be x and then one just greater than is smaller than three. They can't be equal to three because then one of them would be zero. So x has to be smaller than three. There we go. Right. Okay, let's look at this next question. It says the sketch shows the graphs of f of x equals a half to the power of x. Okay. And g of x is equal to a over x plus p plus q. Okay, so now it says B is the point of intersection of the asymptotes of G. Okay, B is the point of intersection of the asymptotes of G. Okay, and A is the Y intercept of F. The graph passes through the origin. Okay, so this is zero. And AB is obviously parallel to X axis. It says write down the equation F of negative one. Um, in the form y is equal to. So what do they actually want us to do? They want us to um, find the inverse. Sorry. Um, so they want us to find the inverse. So what we do is swap the x and y's and solve for y. Okay, so let's do this. So we've got y is equal to a half to the power of x. That's what we've got at the moment. We swap x and y. So x is equal to half to the power of y. And now we solve for y. So what do we do? We are going to log both sides. So we go log x is equal to log a half base to the power of y. The y comes to the front. So we got log x is equal to y log a half. Okay, do you agree that, okay, never mind, because we just want a y. So what we do is divide both sides by log y. So we get log x to the base of a half is equal to y. So y is equal to log x base a half. Then it says write down the domain of f of negative 1. So the domain of f of negative 1 is going to be the range of the original. And the range of the original is, where is it? This is f over here. The range of the original was y is going to be greater than or equal to 0. No, just greater than 0. So therefore the domain of this is now going to be x is just greater than 0. Okay. Now it says calculate the values of x. If 4 Okay, wait. 4 times f of x plus 1 is equal to root 2. So what they're saying is wherever we see, oh, 
you know what, grade 12s, we actually run out of time. We will carry on with this question tomorrow. Tomorrow is Friday, so please remember that the lesson for maths is at 3 p.m. Thanks, grade 12s. Have a great evening.